Hi. Hi. How are you, MJ? It's so nice to see you today. Yes, you too. Looking awesome. good. Yeah, I'm not all fuzzy. No, yeah. not at all. I know. Okay. Okay. So, have you heard of the newest um, trend? It's called testicle tanning. <laughs> no, but I want to. You didn't know. I mean, I know we're here to talk about surrogacy, but I just thought maybe we can talk a little bit about it. Okay, everyone. Oh yeah, yeah. Let's talk about it. And so, I was thinking we can like create a man purr, like a man diaper. And then they can put, it's called red light. It's all over. You have to Google it. You really do. It's hilarious. So Tucker Carlson has come out and said like the problem with America, there's a lot of problems with America right now. And this probably isn't it. The problem in America is that men don't have enough testosterone. So he's recommending that men tan their balls, but they use something called red light to do it. Interesting. So, so is it like so it's a diaper. You said it was a diaper. No, no, I'm saying it's... I'm going to design a diaper. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so like, oh, you okay. have so it doesn't a exist. Okay. A diaper. It doesn't exist yet. Maybe it'll be okay. next year's April Fool's joke. I'm kind of known for these. So maybe <laughs> next April 1st, you are in on the joke now. So don't fall for it. But we'll create like testicle tanning trousers. Amazing. I love yeah. that idea. Yeah. Yeah. I did fall for your April Fool's one this year. I was like, oh, yeah. man, she's, oh, wow, that's really amazing. <laughs> Good for her. Yeah, I mean, I try. I mean, I really do want to make ultrasounds easier for women. Like, there's no reason why people just can't get ultrasounds whenever they want, right? right. Like, without begging a doctor, like, please, I'm having pain. I need to see my insides. So, anyways, well, thank you for having me on. Oh, my gosh, thank you so much. So, let me... Let me just do an introduction, even though you okay. don't need one, but today it is our pleasure, oh my goodness, to have the one and only Egg Whisperer, Dr. Amy. Um, so in case you don't know, she's a fertility specialist based in the San Francisco Bay Area, and she has been practicing for over 15 years. That's and a long today- time. Long time. What? Yes. I said time? that's a long time. Time is flying, though. And I tell I know. jokes today. The testicle tanning one is new though, but I do, it's like the same jokes. I was, someone sent me a video of something that like from six years ago and I literally, it was like the same jokes. And I'm like, I got to mix it up. <laughs> Just got to. I know I have the same thing. I've been teaching also for a long time, a time like I don't want to like articulate, but I just, right. I'm always, it's just hard. <laughs> jokes are hard. It's hard. And you probably can't use the same jokes that I used. Probably, probably not. not. <laughs> I would be fired. You're, you're absolutely <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh. All right. So, um, so today we're just going to talk about surrogacy and mm -hmm. also testicles, apparently. But yep. <laughs> from now on, um, so just let surrogacy. me start with let's start with my first question. Um, so, during your tenure as a fertility specialist, mm -hmm. have you seen any significant shifts in patients using a surrogate or a gestational carrier? Um, so, for example, is it becoming more or less common? Yeah, I think it's becoming more common, don't you think? I feel like it's it's um, something that people are talking about before they've also run out of embryos. So that's like mm -hmm. a really nice thing. I think it's something that I also see fertility doctors just talk to their patients about more and more without making it feel like it's what you do when you're you're done, you know, like this is yeah. your last hope. And so that's that's nice for me to see. And, and so I also feel like there's... Um, there are more people also that are considering surrogacy because they hear these great stories of really amazing journeys. I mean, it's, it's not like the snap of the fingers and all of a sudden you have a surrogate and everything's right. amazing and pregnancy is wonderful. And there's no <laughs> hiccups. I mean, certainly there's, there's stuff that happens along the way, but I just feel like it's more acceptable now to at least talk about it as a possibility during your journey. Oh, okay. That's good. So, I mean, my impression, you know, I've only kind of been here and for like the past, I guess, like two and a half years. So my impression is that it is growing, but, you know, it could be biased because I'm mm -hmm. in this, you know, very small world. And then I keep, right. you know, meeting more and more people, but it's just nice to know from your perspective that you also think that it's growing. Right. Um, right. So these days, what kinds of patients or what types of patients tend to use a surrogate? Like, um, do you have like a typical patient, um, um, diagnosis or, um, yeah, that you would recommend a surrogate to? I mean, the obvious is people without a uterus. Yes. Right. Yes. So that's obvious. Okay. And then for me, I feel like every woman over the age of 45, um, 
should at least talk to their doctor about whether it would be safer or better for them to use a surrogate for their embryo or for them to carry themselves, especially if they worked really, really hard for a long time to create the embryo with their own eggs. Not that donor egg embryos aren't precious, right. but typically that is a renewable resource that you can create more from. But when it's your own eggs, and let's say you're 44 and you got that one golden embryo from right. that golden egg, it is something to consider. Um, you know, just because there are things that can happen to our bodies as we get older. I mean, certainly we do think that older women do have just as good of a chance of carrying a pregnancy to term. But if you've never been pregnant before, how do you know you don't have an issue right. with like preterm labor or um, recurrent pregnancy loss? Because you haven't had an opportunity to, 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 to reveal to your doctor that that is your problem. Then there's also severe adenomyosis and endometriosis. So that's a lot of osis that I just kind of <laughs> threw out there. And it just means basically like your uterus is a little bit on the larger side and there might be a little bit more inflammation. And those two things can make it harder for you to carry a pregnancy to term. So when I have a patient with those issues and it's not like every single person that has that diagnosis needs a surrogate, right. but it's that if it's severe enough, your doctor might bring up using a surrogate. There are also women that have a thin lining of the uterus. Um, that condition is called Asherman's syndrome. Mm -hmm. Uterine synechiae is another term or just a really thin lining. Um, and so if you can't build that plush landing pad for an embryo to kind of snuggle into, um, it makes it harder for implantation to occur. And so sometimes women have to consider using a surrogate in that type of situation as well. And there are other people that they're on medications for you know, different medical conditions, and it's just not safe for them to carry a pregnancy because of the medications that they're on. If they stop the medication, it might harm their own health. And so they might also consider a surrogate. And the thing is like most men who want to have babies, and I'm talking about cis men, um, they can have a baby without ever getting pregnant, mm -hmm. right? And so as women, it's something that I feel like, um, it's okay to say, I want to be a mom, but I'm not going to be able to carry the pregnancy myself. And it should be just as acceptable for a woman to say that as a man. Mm -hmm. So I know long answer to your great no, question. No, no, that was perfect. Short question, <laughs> long answer. No, no, that was great. Um, and so I guess it's, it's kind of related um, to another question that I had a little bit later. Yeah. Um, so you were talking about all these other, di these diagnoses. And I was wondering, um, like 10 years ago or 15 years ago, would you be less, like, would you be less hesitant to suggest using a gestational carrier versus now, because now it's more accepted. So now you're more likely to offer that as a, not you specifically, uh, but just in general. Right. I think in general, from a societal norms standpoint, I feel like these things are more talked about more acceptable, there's less shame and less stigma. So we're all social people and we all still unfortunately like to seek approval of our family members, our mm -hmm. friends, our partners. And so sometimes if you think you wanna do something and someone says to you, well, I don't agree, then you might be influenced by the things that they're saying. But I, I feel like more and more people are seeing stories of other people going through this process and they feel more empowered and they yeah. have the strength to be able to stand up for themselves and what they believe should be part of their journey. And they go and they do it. Amazing. Well, that's, yeah. that's what we love to hear. Um, so there's that part too, which is great. Um, like the more acceptance, but I can also, and I'm just guessing here that um, assisted reproductive technologies has also increased, like there's more innovation. So there might be more things to try um, that might solve the issue and have a patient avoid using a gestational carrier. And so I was wondering if that, that other, that, that effect was also going on. Whereas like, maybe we don't use gestational carriers as much because we have these other, um, innovations that we might use to help. And you guys, everyone listening is going to be surprised to hear that 
we really don't have as many innovations. I mean, oh. I really wish that we did. I mean, the IVF that I'm doing today is pretty darn similar to the IVF I did five years ago and the IVF that I did 10 years ago. Some of the protocols have changed. You know, there's some things that we might be doing differently, like intrauterine PRP. A lot of people are talking about mm -hmm. that, for yeah. example, before you go to a surrogate. Um, but for the most part, we really haven't been able to figure out, especially when you have a euploid, which means a genetically normal embryo, yeah, based on the technology, why those darn embryos aren't sticking 100% of the time. Right. Right. And it's heartbreaking, it's heart shattering, it's all those words, and those words don't even come close to the feeling of finding out that an embryo that you worked so hard for didn't attach. And I wish that we had better tools and we just don't. So I don't think that we're in a situation where people are using surrogacy less because we as a scientific community have been able to figure this out. We're just not there yet. Somebody asked, and I also have the same question. Um, do you have an understanding like why? Like, why is that? I mean, it's kind of a, like a, I don't know if you have like- Oh yeah, I know the why. Of, Okay. I mean, the why is a lot of this is in our genes and it's genetic. It's also in the embryos, but we're only looking at chromosomes. There's so much more genetic mm -hmm. information for us to learn. We're not efficient as human beings. And just because an embryo has normal chromosomes doesn't mean that it's normal everything. And I think people mean that normal chromosomes means healthy embryo. Normal chromosomes just means normal chromosomes based on the technology's limitations and that's it. Oh, sorry, I meant, um, oh. do you have, sorry, no, no, that was wonderful. That was, <laughs> <laughs> No, you can tell me. But I, I guess don't worry. Yeah. You can tell me I do better talking about testicle tanning. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess why is there this lag? Um, why why isn't there enough innovation, or why hasn't there been a lot of innovation in this field? It's, the lack of funding. And oh, we're trying. Well, it's very expensive. It is really really hard. I mean, I'm a human. We yeah. Just the, you know, genome sequencing is just now a thing, right? For a human. An embryo is, I mean, obviously it's not even that small. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like you can't even see it with your eyes. These embryos are microscopic. So to be able to actually fully sequence an embryo's genome, it's not near impossible, but people are trying to make the near impossible possible. Mm -hmm. And once we can do that, then we're going to have this huge like aha moment. And it's going to be incredible for people like me who really want to, you know, I, I, every procedure I do, it's like, you know, hours and hours of my time of preparation. And, and if that doesn't work, um, it's devastating. And so like, right. if I can have more answers before I even put an embryo in, and I can kind of guide people and pick the embryo that truly is best from a genetic competency standpoint, then I think we're going to be able to increase pregnancy rates closer to what I think they should be. It'd be amazing if they're hundred percent. That's right. my hope that one day they will be. So it just sounds like it'll be like long periods of like not a lot of progress and then boom, some big thing will happen and then shift. Well, the I mean, I know thing, I'm just like, no, no, there are big, the big shift. Yes. Just like you're like the biggest ass, the biggest shift. <laughs> it is going to happen. And there are companies like they're working like, I mean, probably secretly and they just don't want me to talk about it. Right. I mean, soon you guys won't see me tomorrow and you'll be like, where did she go? <laughs> I talked about it. And then you guys all know. <laughs> but there are scientists out there that are working on this, like as we're speaking right now, but the technology is so expensive, the cost to yeah. just even like be in a trial like this, we're talking about like you have to enroll and you have to front like $50,000. I mean, like that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, and I guess there's also like ethical concerns too that, I don't know. I mean, I don't even know how much that factors. Well, we're not talking about polygenic risk scores and that kind of stuff. We're really talking about looking, like for me, I'd be looking at genes that are, like I would love to see if an embryo has a gene that's um, abnormal related to like implantation, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be nice to yeah. know ahead of time that this right. embryo is, you know, not as, as good as another one. Um, okay, well that, all of that answered the question perfectly. Um, yeah. So gestational carriers must be medically cleared before proceeding. Mm -hmm. um, what is the most common reason for a gestational carrier not to pass clearance? And do you have any tips for any intended parents or gestational carriers before medical clearance? Okay, so most common reason for a surrogate not to pass is that 
she thought she had an uncomplicated pregnancy, but it actually was complicated. Like her blood pressure was high and she had preeclampsia, mm -hmm. but she didn't realize it. And then by the time I get the records, I'm like, oh, your blood pressure was really high. And they're like, oh, they said it was fine though. Oh, they gave me magnesium. It was not a big deal. I just oh, took wow. a little bit. I just took a little bit of labetalol. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, no, you're not passing medical clearance, you know? Or like, oh, I bled, but it was just a little bit. And I needed just one unit of blood. You know, it's like, yeah, obviously someone who wants to do this for someone else, like loved pregnancy and they didn't think that what could be a complication to one person would be a disaster to somebody else. Yeah. And so I get it. And, you know, that's the number one reason is some sort of pregnancy complication is usually it. And then the other stuff would be, you know, you know, maybe like a history of postpartum depression. And that's not, you know, I, I, I have a hard time ever considering someone who has that. And I think mm -hmm. <laughs> 10 out of 10 doctors would agree. Um, anyone yeah. with like active anxiety, let's say they're taking anxiety meds in the last six months, especially, but yeah. I mean, people have anxiety. I mean, if you just like go to the news, you're going to have anxiety. So it'd be you weird to meet someone that says, I don't have any anxiety at all. So I think right. those are the two biggest reasons. Okay. And then your other question, you know, as far as tips for IPs and surrogates before medical clearance. So I'll just share with you what I do. Okay. And I try and troubleshoot these issues ahead of time. And still, despite what I do, sometimes things come up later that I would have never have been able to predict would happen. Yeah. So what I do for my patients, this is such an emotional journey. I don't want patients talking to surrogates and getting emotionally involved and connected until I've done my medical part. I see. So that's the one thing I think that can really help intended parents is have a doctor review medical records for you first and then do a match meeting. Okay. Don't do a match meeting first, match with someone and then bring them to a doctor because then it feels like something's been taken away from you. Like you were so close right. and then so far and it's just much easier not to, I mean, it's hard because obviously you're excited. You want to meet someone, you want to move forward, but if it doesn't work out, now you've made this relationship and you feel bad and you feel sad and you had a friend, you, you, there was a friend that you thought that you had and now they're not your friend anymore. And they still could right. be because obviously surrogates are amazing people. And, you know, even right. when I've had patients meet a surrogate that didn't, you know, qualify for medical reasons, sometimes they're still lifelong friends afterwards. Yeah. You know? So, and then as far as, you know, tips for surrogates before medical clearance, start your prenatals now. Oh, don't okay. start after you, I would say like 50% aren't on a vitamin and their vitamin D is really low. And so I, I have to spend after medical clearance, making sure that their vitamin D goes up. Right. And so How that's that my take? biggest tip. Not, not that long. I mean, okay. vitamin D takes time to go up, but it's not going to like, you know, delay us long right. at okay. all, but that's like number one. Number two, if you're thinking about being a surrogate and you're okay with being on birth control pills, get on a birth control pill so I can start your clearing your um, clearance appointment sooner than later. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I have surrogates, a lot of them, they're done with their babies, so their tubes are tied. And then I explain to them, like get on a birth control. They're like, but I'm not trying to get pregnant. I'm like, no, no, no. I know that we use birth <laughs> control pills as medical clearance planning pills and frozen embryo transfer planning pills. They're not to prevent you from getting pregnant. We already know that you cannot, but that's one thing a surrogate can do so that I'm not like waiting an entire month for the period to start so that I can start right. the birth control pill. Yeah. Okay. So. And so taking the birth control before the medical clearance won't interfere with anything that would happen during. I mean, it, can because... it can only help. It just gets the show on the road, okay. so to speak. Yeah. So that's kind of what I wait for. It's like period starts, get on birth control pill, saline sonogram, preconception right. labs, those are the steps. And if, 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 if let's say your, if your cycle day seven and you haven't started your birth control pills and I can't coordinate things like in a day, then I'm waiting an entire month to start that process. Right. And how, yeah. how far in advance, like how many cycles do you need for them to be on the birth control to get, is it just one cycle or I guess? Oh, I can do medical clearance within two weeks. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So if someone's already on a pill, sailing, sauna, preconception labs, they come back and cleared. Wow. 
Okay. Yeah, so I, I interviewed the surrogate after I've reviewed all of their medical records and they do clearance. Um, and so it, it can be fairly uh, efficient. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so where do you think the surrogacy industry is headed? Or surrogacy in general? Well, I'm going to be char in charge of everything very soon. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I have all these ideas and things that I'm going to be um, bringing to everybody. I'm going to predict probably in the next three months. Oh, uh, I, I would say there's so much fraud out there mm -hmm. and I am just sick and tired of it. Gosh, darn it. And what I mean by that is people present themselves one way, but it's a different way. And I'll just share an example with you, like a surrogate, for example, who said that she's never carried for anyone before, has never been a surrogate before, but in fact, she had two miscarriages. Oh, wow. And has been through several journeys and is not being truthful, right? And so right. Um, it, 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 it's kind of hard to know. If, how, how would you know if someone's lying about that or not? You just, there, you would have no way of knowing. Because it's not tracked? Medically, but, like the records or? Well, if she doesn't disclose it, if she doesn't provide a medical, would, yeah. that I would have no way of knowing looking at her uterus that any of that had happened, right? So that's just one of um, many situations. And I, and I feel like, you know, you're probably on some surrogacy private groups. I imagine on Facebook, for example. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I feel like if we had a way to get surrogates third party certified mm -hmm. so that they basically um, have had, you know, criminal background checks, drug screens already, um, they've done the psych by someone who is not related to the agency or, or doctor. So someone else that has no motivation to push a surrogate through, mm -hmm. I feel like that might be a better system because sometimes you have psychologists that work for agencies and they're very motivated to pass. Otherwise they won't have that job with the agency. Right. And so there is a bias because okay. of that. And I'm trying to like remove the bias, make sure that screens are done as, um, uh, as well as possible so that parents aren't deceived and, at the same time, the other direction too. I mean, you have parents that have also not gone through proper psych education. Right. And we also need to do better along those lines where parents are offered psychological, there should be like milestones throughout the pregnancy where a psychologist outside of the agency is facilitating meetings to make sure that the relationships continue to be healthy throughout the surrogacy journey. So this is not the agency. You're saying this should be somebody else? Um, I mean, I feel like the agency, ideally, if I were to rule the world, which I might not do that, but I, I would like to with what's going on in the world right now. I, <laughs> I might just quit my job and you're going to see, I have to change my last name. It's too long to be on a ballot. But at some <laughs> point, you might see my name on a ballot trying to rule the world in some way. Um, but for now, all I can do is talk about surrogacy and fertility. But yeah, so that's, so that's kind of what I would propose is some sort of, um, the agency would arrange for it, but it would be an unbiased, you know, psychologist that has um, no allegiance to the agency mm -hmm. and no allegiance necessarily to the surrogate, but is on everyone's team, just trying to facilitate healthy relationships throughout the surrogacy journey. So this is what you would like to see. This is kind of your, 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 I hope. do. I try and mirror it in my practice, but like it does, you know, it, it, I feel like every day I'm like, okay, today's the day. Like, this is what I'm going to do it. And so, you know, I'd like to see more of this. So if I can be the model, mm -hmm. then perhaps other people will replicate this in their own practice. And mm -hmm. then surrogates will start asking for it. It will be like, the surrogate would be like, where's my psychologist on demand? I need right. a session and I need to pull in the intended parent because we need to have healthier communications right now. Yeah. So maybe I'll call it that surrogacy psychologist on demand. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, that was the one thing with our journey that I wish that we, um, uh, I just wish that we had more, we, we had a therapist. I mean, I just wish it would, I mean, we were great with communication and there wasn't anything, but if I were to make it like even better, it just would be yeah. nice. And then that never really came up. Um, but you know, there's some points in the pregnancy that are scary. Right. Um, like our surrogate, she was bleeding and we thought for sure she had a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, from, and she's trying to deal with my feelings and it's not fair to her. Um, and so it would just been nice if I had to do it again, if, she, if I could, if we could get her somebody that she could talk to and just, and I, so I totally right. agree with that. Um, right. Oh, and then the other thing that I do if I rule the world is yes. sensitive, um, sensitivity training for OBGYNs as it pertains to dealing with intended parents. Oh, yeah. I just feel like, I mean, I just want to like spray whipped cream, you know, I don't want to hit them because that would be really mm -hmm. mean. But you know, like that whipped cream thing where like whipped cream smacks you in the face. Oh, you mean like things... the thing that hits you in the face? Yeah, totally. Oh, yeah, yeah, I just yeah. feel like some of the things ob and say, just like, I'm like, seriously, like this patient of mine worked so hard for this pregnancy and you're going to treat them like that right now, Yeah, you know, in a stressful situation. So there should almost be like some, you know, someone that would help the intended parent as a, um, like a concierge person that would like, I mean, it should be automatic, not concierge. Concierge makes it seem like only some people have access right, to it. Sure, yes. But I feel like, you know, when you go to the Hyatt, everyone can walk up to concierge and be like, what's the best restaurant? And right. I feel like as an intended parent, you should go to the concierge. And you're like, hey, you know, I'd like to communicate with my baby, my baby's doctor, just to be filled on what's going on with the visit and how everything's going. And then more times than not, the OBGYN will say, well, you're not the patient. I'm just like, stop talking like that to my patients. That's so yeah. freaking rude and mean. Like, I can't even imagine saying that to a human who has, a, you know, their baby in someone else's tummy and treating yeah. them like they're an alien. It's just not fair. No, I totally, we, we have an intended parent support session. And that was something that came up. And a lot of people had this experience like you're describing where yeah. they, yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe the ob can could have like a certification and we'll like send them Starbucks cards <laughs> or like <laughs> go to the sensitivity training and whatever your special drink is, like we'll send it to you unlimited for a year. I mean, that wouldn't be hard. I mean, that's affordable, yeah. right? right? Like yeah. whatever your drink is, whatever your favorite flowers, your plant, we'll like, we'll, we'll get those <laughs> plants delivered to your office for just being such a flower and a gem of a person. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I would 100% support that. Yeah. 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 Um, all right, my, the last question. Oh my is God, there... last? I could be doing this all night. Seriously, last? <laughs> You're going to do I'm just kidding. No, it's okay. You, can... <laughs> you probably have other things to do. It's okay. Yeah, go no, for it. Nothing, yeah, nothing better than this. Yeah. But I don't have any other questions. I'm questioned out after this one. <laughs> is there any such thing as the perfect uterus? I mean, I call them the unicorn uterus. You know, that uterus, like, yeah, I mean, I think there is, I mean, there are some, they're like magnets, you know, like you put an embryo in and mm -hmm. it's like, they just, I have, I've seen them before. And when you see them, you know them. Um, so you can I see it say, beforehand? You can no, see it? You can't, oh, okay. you can't. <laughs> you can't, it's hard. But obviously, like, there's a shape to a uterus, a texture, a thickness of the lining that we look for. And most of my surrogates will obviously have that. And there are some situations where you're like, ah, I don't know, the lining's too thin. Should we wait? Should we give her another chance? And sometimes you give her another chance and she makes a nice lining and you're like, cool. And sometimes you, you don't get to transfer her lining's thin and you give her another chance and the lining's still thin and you say, you know what, um, I think we have to move on. So you thought the uterus was great, but then yeah. now we're in a different situation. We're on medications and it's maybe been the passage of time since her last pregnancy. And you notice that things aren't as good as they used to be. Um, well, so I guess the reason why I, I, I asked that question, and I'm not here to call out any particular agency, but I did notice when I was searching for a, a surrogacy agency that there was one that would charge a different price depending, they had like a golden feature versus like a standard or silver feature, whatever. And it was... So like under the, let's just say the golden feature, like they said, you get, you will get matched with the gestational carrier with like these qualifications. 
they're younger, fewer pregnancies, lower BMI mm -hmm. versus the standard where your gestational carry can be older versus, you know, or like more pregnancies or, and when I saw that, I was horrified. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if I was like overreact. And so to me, the idea that you could say that, oh, this particular person with this characteristics would be a better gestational carrier than, you know, this one to me just didn't seem like it was based on anything. And I guess I'm like painting, I'm like biasing you to say one, one way, but I am totally open for you telling yeah. me. That. Yeah. So what I would say is when information is presented like that, it makes you assume that there's an issue with someone who's over 35, who's had right. pregnancies. And the reality is that's not true. I mean, if I have someone who's 38, 39 years old, and they've had a pregnancy in the last three years, that was like, perfect, no complications. That person to me is just as good of a surrogate as someone who's 27 years old. Mm -hmm. And believe me, I have patients that come in, they're like, I want a 21 year old surrogate. I'm like, Oh, no, like, <laughs> no, I mean, like most women who are surrogates, most of the time, I would say, over 50% of the time are done with their own family building. Yeah. And someone who's 21, who's had one baby that wants to have another baby. I mean, they're not usually done with their family building. And so that's one thing I usually encourage surrogates to do. So when they come to see me, because I'm also a fertility doctor for all of you guys who don't know. <laughs> so if I have, let's say, a 37-year-old surrogate and she's actually not done and wants one more baby, I'll check an AMH level and I'll tell her, I say, look, you, you, you should actually have your own baby first yeah. and then be a surrogate for somebody else. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, all right. Well, um, that was wonderful. I cannot Aww, even so begin sweet. to thank you enough for Aww. spending your time with me and us. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, MJ. It's so nice to, to meet you finally and see you here and hang out. Um, I hope you have a lovely weekend. Thank you. You too. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Bye, everyone. See you Bye. Bye-bye.